Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today, just sneaking in before the end of Q1 2022, Intel are finally detailing their first ARC discrete GPUs as promised. We've got all the details, including specs on the GPU dies themselves, the various product configurations that Intel are announcing first up, and some of the exclusive features Intel will be bringing to their graphics family. As has been expected for some time now, the first Intel ARC GPUs are destined for laptops, which is a little different to what the other two GPU vendors in AMD and NVIDIA usually do, which is to launch desktop products first. However, desktop cards are still coming. Intel are saying Q2 2022 for these products, and some of the details we're going to talk about today do apply to desktop cards such as the GPU die details. I believe Intel are also going to be doing some sort of small teaser for add-in cards today. We didn't get pre-briefed on that beforehand, which is a bit annoying, but I'm sure you'll be able to check out whatever Intel said shortly. This is what Intel's Arc GPU family will look like. Intel are preparing three tiers of products with a similar naming scheme used to their CPUs. We've got Arc 3 at the low end. This will be basic discrete graphics options with performance somewhat higher than integrated. Arc 5 as a mainstream mid-tier option equivalent to say an RTX 3060 type of position in the market. And then Arc 7 for Intel's highest performing parts. We're not expecting Intel's flagship GPU to necessarily compete with the fastest GPUs from AMD or Intel today in the RX 6800 and RTX 3080 tiers and above, so Arc 7 is probably going to top out around a mid to high end GPU in the market right now. The first GPUs to hit the market will be Arc 3 coming in April, with Arc 5 and Arc 7 coming in the summer of 2022, so in December of this year. Wait, I'm, I'm just being told here that actually they don't mean the Southern Hemisphere summer, they really mean more the middle of 2022. So looking like end of Q2 timeframe, which is when we'll likely also see the desktop cards. Let's dive straight into the product specifications, and I'll start here with the GPU dies. The two chips being shown here are not the GPU SKUs we'll actually see in laptops, rather the actual die specifications that Intel are making in the Alchemist series. The larger die is called ACM G10. This is like a GA104 or Navi22 equivalent from NVIDIA and AMD respectively. The smaller die is ACM G11, which is closer in size to GA107 and Navi24. Both are fabricated on TSMC's N6 node, as has been previously announced. ACM G10 features 32 XE cores and 32 ray tracing cores. If you're more familiar with Intel's older execution unit measurement for their GPUs, 32 XE cores is the equivalent of 512 execution units, with each XE core containing 16 vector engines for standard shader work and 16 matrix engines primarily for machine learning work. Intel combines four XE cores into a render slice, so the top ACM G10 configuration has eight render slices. We're also seeing here in the spec sheet 16 megabytes of L2 cache and a 256-bit GDDR6 memory subsystem. We're getting PCIe 4.0 times 16 with this die, two media engines, and a four-pipe display engine, so essentially supporting four outputs. Not shown on this slide are the die size specifications. Intel told us this larger variant is 406 square millimeters and 21.7 billion transistors. Size wise, this is larger than AMD's Navi 22, which is 335 square millimeters and 17.2 billion transistors. It ends up more around NVIDIA's GA104 at 393 square mil, but less dense on Samsung's 8 nanometer at 17.4 billion for the GA104 there. So that should give you a rough expectation here, the size and class of Intel's biggest GPU die is similar to the upper mid-tier dies from their competitors, which go into products like the RTX 3070 Ti and RX 6700 XT. Intel do not have a 500 square millimeter plus die this generation to compete with the biggest GPUs from AMD and Nvidia. The smaller die is ACM G11, and that has eight XE cores and eight ray tracing units. So this is 128 execution units or just two render slices. The L2 cache is cut down to four megabytes as a result, and the memory subsystem ends up as 96 bit GDDR6. However, while this GPU has just a quarter of the XE cores as the larger die, we'll still be getting two media engines and four display pipelines, which will be very useful for content creators. It also features a PCIe 4.0x8 interface. Intel did not make the mistake of dropping this to x4 like AMD did with their entry-level GPUs. 
As for die size, Intel are quoting 157 square millimeters and 7.2 billion transistors. This sits pretty much between AMD's Navi 24 and Nvidia's GA107. Navi 24 is tiny at just 107 square millimeters and 5.4 billion transistors. Nvidia hasn't spoken officially about GA107, but we've measured it to be roughly 200 square millimeters in laptop form factors. In only including 8 XE cores with the ACM G11 design, this isn't that much larger than the integrated GPU Intel includes with 12th gen Old Lake CPUs. Those CPUs top out at 96 execution units, making ACM G11 just 33% larger, so this is firmly an entry level GPU product. However, ACM G11 does benefit from features like GDDR6 memory and ray tracing cores, so there are more avenues for performance uplifts over integrated graphics than just having more cores. As for end products that consumers will be buying, there are five SKUs in total that use these two dies. The two ARC3 products use ACM G11, while the three GPUs split across ARC5 and 7 will use ACM G10. So when Intel says ARC3 is launching now, this is clearly a launch for the ACM G11 die, while the larger ACM G10 has to wait. In the ARC3 series, we have an 8-core option, the A370M, and a 6-core option, the A350M, both with 4GB of GDDR6 memory. Interestingly, despite Intel quoting a 96-bit memory bus for ACM G11, that's been cut down for these products to just 64 bits to better align with 4GB of capacity. Were Intel to stick with 96-bit, these GPUs would have had to choose between 6 or 3GB of memory in a standard configuration. When it comes to clock speeds, the A370M is listed at 1550 MHz for its graphics clock, while the A350M is at 1150 MHz. So what is a graphics clock? Well, this is a very similar definition to AMD's game clock. Intel is saying the graphics clock isn't the maximum frequency the GPU can run at, rather the typical average frequency you'll see across a wide range of workloads. Specifically for these mobile products, the graphics clock listed on the spec sheet is in relation to the lowest TDP configuration configuration Intel offers. So for the A370M with a 35 to 50 watt power range, the 1550 MHz clock is what you'll typically see at 35 watts, with 50 watts giving users a higher frequency. Intel are specifically being conservative here to avoid misleading customers. The clock speed is kind of a minimum spec. Arc 5 with the A550M uses half of an ACM G10 die cut down to 16 XE cores and a 128-bit GDDR6 memory bus supporting 8GB of VRAM. With a 60 watt TDP, it'll run at 900 MHz, which is quite low, but there will also be up to 80 watt configurations. Then for Arc 7, we get the full spec configurations for top tier gaming laptops. The A770M includes the entire ACM G10 die with 32 XE cores, 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 on a 256 bit bus, and a graphics clock of 1650 megahertz at 120 watts. Intel says that some configurations of Arc can run at the 2 GHz mark or higher, so this is likely what we'll see for the 150 watt upper tier variants. The A730M is a cut down ACM G10 with 24 XE cores and a 192 bit memory bus supporting 12 GB of GDDR6. Its graphics clock is 1100 MHz with an 80 to 120 watt power range. So between all of these products, Intel are covering all the usual laptop power options from 25 watts right through to 150 watts. As Intel are mostly focusing on on the ARC 3 launch for now, we did get a few performance benchmarks comparing the A370M in a system with Intel's Core i7-12700H to the integrated 96 execution unit XE GPU in the Core i7-1280P. The ARC A370M is not exactly setting a high performance standard with Intel targeting just 1080p 60fps using medium to high quality settings, however this is a very basic low power discrete GPU option for mainstream thin and light laptops. Depending on the game, we appear to be getting between 25 and 50% more performance than Intel's best iGPU option, although Intel didn't specify what power configuration we are looking at for the A370M. However, I do have question marks over whether the A370M will be faster than the new Radeon 680M integrated GPU AMD offers in their Ryzen 6000 APUs. 
We know this iGPU as configured in the Ryzen 9 6900HS is approximately 35% faster than the 96 execution unit iGPU in a CPU like the Core i9-12900HK, so it's quite possible that the A370M and Radeon 680M will trade blows. This wouldn't be a particularly amazing outcome for Intel's smaller Arc Alchemist die, so we'll have to hope that it does outperform the current best iGPU option when we get around to benchmarking it. Intel didn't offer any performance estimates for how their products compare to either AMD or Nvidia options, and usually Intel doesn't mind comparing their stuff to their competitors, so I guess this might be a bit of a red flag. Alright, let's now breeze through some of the features Arc GPUs will be offering. The first is that XE cores themselves will be able to run floating point integer and XMX instructions concurrently. The vector engines themselves have separate floating point and integer units, so with modern GPUs you'd expect concurrent usage and that's possible here in keeping with other architectures. The media engine appears to be extremely powerful. These Arc GPUs are the first to offer AV1 hardware encoding acceleration. So this isn't just decoding like AMD and Nvidia's latest GPUs offer, this is full encoding support as well. We also get the usual support for H.264 and HEVC with up to 8K 12-bit decodes and 8K 10-bit encodes. AV1 encoding support is huge for moving forward the AV1 ecosystem, especially for content creators that might want to leverage the higher coding efficiency AV1 offers over older codecs. However, Intel's demo here was a bit bizarre, showing AV1 for game streaming purposes. It's all well and good that Arc GPUs can stream Elden Ring in an AV1 codec, but this isn't actually useful in practice right now, as major streaming services like Twitch and YouTube don't support AV1 ingest. In fact, Twitch right now doesn't even support HEVC, so I wouldn't hold your breath for AV1 support anytime soon. Arc GPUs supporting this will be much more useful for creator productivity workloads for now. While the media engine is looking pretty great, the display engine, not so much. Intel is supporting DisplayPort 1.4a and HDMI 2.0b here, and claiming it's DisplayPort 2.0 10G ready. However, there is no support for HDMI 2.1, which is a pretty ridiculous omission given the current state of GPUs. Not only has the HDMI 2.1 specification been available since late 2017, it's been integrated into both AMD and Nvidia GPUs since 2020, with a wide variety of displays now including HDMI 2.1. Using last generation HDMI is a terrible misstep and it hurts compatibility with TVs in particular that usually don't offer DisplayPort. Intel's solution for OEMs wanting to integrate HDMI 2.1 is building in a DisplayPort to HDMI 2.1 converter using an external chip, but this is hardly an ideal solution, especially for laptops that are constrained on size and power. Intel didn't want to elaborate too much on the HDMI 2.1 issue, so I'm still not 100% sure whether this only applies to certain products, but I'd be pretty disappointed if their desktop Arc products don't support HDMI 2.1 natively, and to be honest, it's not looking good in that area. Another disappointing revelation from Intel's media conference was in relation to XESS. Intel is showing support for 14 XESS titles when the technology launches with Arc 5 and 7 GPUs this summer. However, there's a catch here. The first implementation of XESS will only support Intel's XMX instructions and therefore will be exclusive to Intel GPUs. As a refresher, XMX are Intel's XE matrix extensions, basically an equivalent to Nvidia's Tensor operations, which are vendor exclusive and vendor optimized. As XMX is designed for Arc to be run on their XMX cores, it only runs on Arc GPUs. Now, XESS will eventually support other GPUs through a separate pipeline, the DP4A pipeline, which will work on GPUs supporting shader model 6.4 and above, so that's NVIDIA Pascal and newer, plus AMD RDNA and newer. However, Intel mentioned in a tidbit that the DP4A version will not be available at the same time as the XMX version, with Intel's initial focus going towards the XMX version on Intel GPUs. This is despite Intel previously saying XESS uses a single API with one library that then has two paths inside for each version depending on the hardware. It seems that while this may be the goal eventually, possibly a second iteration of XESS or an update down the line, the initial XESS implementation is is XMX only. 
This isn't good news for XCSS and could make the technology dead on arrival. Around the time XCSS is supposed to launch, AMD will be releasing FidelityFX Super Resolution 2.0, which is a temporal upscaling solution that will work on all GPUs at launch. I don't see the incentive for developers to integrate XCSS into their games if it only works on Arc GPUs, which will only be a minuscule fraction of the total GPU market, especially if they could use FSR 2.0 instead. Intel really can't afford to go down the DLSS path with exclusivity. That works for Nvidia as they have a dominant market share and developers integrating DLSS know they can at least target a large percentage of customers. Intel doesn't have that in the GPU market yet and won't anytime soon, so releasing the version of XCSS that works on competitor GPUs is crucial for adoption of that technology. One technology Intel talked about did catch my eye though, and that's SmoothSync. This is a technology built into the display engine that can blur the boundary between two frames when you're playing in a VSync off configuration. This is mostly meant for basic fixed refresh rate displays where you'll still want to game at a high frame rate above the monitor's refresh rate for latency benefits. Intel says this only adds 0.5 milliseconds of latency for a 1080p frame. Unfortunately, the demo image here is simulated, but I'll be keen to check out how effective this is in practice. Intel also announced a technology called Dynamic PowerShare, which is essentially a copy of AMD's SmartShift and Nvidia's Dynamic Boost, designed to work with laptops that have Intel CPUs and Intel GPUs. As we've seen from SmartShift and Dynamic Boost, these technologies balance the total power budget of a laptop between the CPU and GPU, depending on the demands of the workload, and that's exactly what Dynamic PowerShare brings. Then we have two other technologies, one called Hyperencode, which is able to combine the media encoding engine on an Intel CPU with the encoding engine on the GPU for increased performance. In supported applications using the One VPL API, this essentially splits up the encoding process between the two engines before stitching them back together. Intel says this can provide up to a 60% performance uplift over using one encoding engine. And there's a similar tech for Compute called Hypercompute, which offers up to 24% more performance. Lastly, Intel showed off their new control center as part of their driver suite called Arc Control, which will be available for all of their GPU products. Intel's driver suite did need a bit of an overhaul and is a key point of contention for buyers looking at an Arc GPU versus Nvidia or AMD. Arc Control is set to at least improve their interface in offering features like performance metrics and tuning, creative features like background removal for webcams, built-in driver update support, and of course, all the usual settings. And unlike GeForce Experience, it won't require a user account or login. The bigger concern for Intel is more driver optimization in games themselves, and there's nothing really that Intel can say here to satisfy buyers until reviewers can see how these products perform across a wide range of games. Intel say they will be providing day one driver updates in line with what Nvidia and AMD have been doing, and have been putting a lot of work into developer relations, but this is a mammoth task for a new GPU vendor, and something both AMD and Nvidia have had a lot of time to build up. So it will definitely be interesting to see where it all lands when Arc GPUs are available to test. And that's pretty much it for Intel's Arc GPU announcement. Bit of a mixed bag if I'm honest here, there are definitely some positive points and things to look forward to, but also some disappointments around the technology and features. With Intel only ready to launch Arc 3 series GPUs at this point, rather than the more powerful Arc 5 and 7 series, which appear at least three months away, in some respects, it feels like this launch was mostly about Intel fulfilling their promise of a Q1 2022 launch for Arc. I'm sure ideally Intel wouldn't be launching low-end products first. We still have yet another wait to see what the big GPUs have in store for us. With that said, it was good to see some actual specifications for Arc GPU dies and SKUs at this point, including memory configurations, which have lined up relatively well with a lot of what the rumors were saying. I'm also glad to see Intel pushing ahead with AV1 hardware encoding acceleration, the first of any vendor to offer that feature. However, I was pretty unimpressed to see the lack of HDMI 2.1 support and the news that XCSS will only be launching with Intel exclusive XMX support to begin with. That combined with delays for high-end SKUs that push closer to the launch of next-gen NVIDIA and AMD GPUs, yeah, there are certainly a lot of hurdles for Intel to overcome with this launch, but either way we'll hopefully be able to benchmark at least some Arc discrete GPUs soon. Anyway, that's it for this one. If you're interested in supporting the channel and some of the news updates that we do in our independent testing, as always, we do have our float plan and Patreon pages, links are in the description below. You'll gain access to our monthly live streams, behind the scenes videos, Discord chat, all that good stuff. And of course, if you don't wanna do that, then consider subscribing. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one.